Hi, I'm Rachel Rudolph, the Extension Vegetable Specialist at the University of Kentucky. This is Brent Rao, International and Sustainable Ag Specialist at the University of Kentucky. And today we're going to talk about rainwater catchment. So we are at a small commercial farm outside of Lexington, Kentucky. They've been using the rainwater catchment system that we're going to be showing you today for about five years yeah. there roughly. And just to keep in mind, um, this is, we're in a, this is November. So they're kind of in a transition period. So that's why you won't see too many things growing. They're kind of taking things out and putting things back in. So that's why you're wondering why there's a lot of weeds and uh, <laughs> things not actively growing. That's why. Um, but the system is still totally operational and we'll walk you through um, kind of the ins and outs, things to keep in mind, um, and some add-ons for a potential rainwater catchment system for your high tunnel. So uh, the first thing, Brent, you're the, you know, aficionado of rainwater catchment systems here at UK. So the first thing people need to keep in mind is the tank, right? You need to get the tank first. Uh, these are sort of international standard for transporting liquids in container ships and within the country. They're called uh, coat tanks, 1,000 liters, one cubic meter, or about 275 gallons. And you can you can find these everywhere. Uh, Second hand, they run about anywhere from 40 to $100, depending on the condition um, definitely want to look for one that's had food products or soft drink products or something like that in it food, food grade uh, tanks but they're very sturdy and readily available so they hold uh, nearly 300 gallons and i think nrcs um, they offer or they provide an example of a tank that's slightly bigger than those much, big black much, much bigger, yeah. tanks. Um, so, you know, you're not absolutely bound to buy something like yeah. this, but this is a, you know, upcycled yeah. product that is fairly readily available. Yeah. The only difference with the really big tanks is if you need to elevate them, they'll be really hard to right. get, get off the ground. These are the ones here are not elevated other than a few inches, but we have others that are up two, three, five feet off the ground. Yeah, let's talk about that. Um, so that's kind of a, you know, we see water tanks in cities and towns, right? And they're really high yep. off the ground. And so people have translated that kind of idea to these kind of systems, but it's not absolutely necessary, right, for these tanks to be super high off the ground. No. And uh, it depends on the size of the plot or the high tunnel you're trying to irrigate. Uh, with a larger space, you need more pressure. And the height of the water column translates into pressure. And this, for example, I marked it here a few minutes ago, but right here, the, if the water is at this height, that's two feet, four inches, that's equivalent to one pound per square inch of, of pressure. It doesn't matter how big this tank is, it could be 500 gallons. It only matters the height, height of the water between the water level here and the ground that you're irrigating. So we found in hundreds of tests here at UK and also in Southeast Asia that we could irrigate even up to a quarter of an acre with about five feet of water pressure, sometimes even down as low as three and four feet. Mm -hmm. So you and know, your one standard, to two PSI. Yeah, and your standard tunnel is you know, point, yeah. let's say a 30, 30 by 96 tunnel is, a, I think, point zero six of an acre. So we're well within range to yeah. be able to irrigate with something like this at yeah. the height that you need. And it, this tunnel is only, I don't know what, 12 by 60 or something. Yeah, maybe 15 by 40 or yeah. something like that. But they've yeah. been they've been irrigating with this tank for several years now without any trouble. And you might think, well, the, the drip lines close to the tank are going to put out a lot more water than those the farthest in. But 
with this size tunnel, that's not the case. It's extremely uniform if you follow a few simple guidelines. And those guidelines are? <laughs> <laughs> well, the first thing is that you need a fairly large opening from the tank and you need to, and you need to carry on that opening size all the way to where you take off the drip lines off the main pipe. And in this case, it's a one and a half inch PVC. I think the opening on the tank is probably two inches. I don't remember, but um, that's the key to the whole thing. You don't want to restrict that. You don't want a tiny hose coming off the no. tank. You want it as, as large as you can yes. make it. So if the opening's two inches, you want to keep it as close to that as, yeah. as possible. And like I say, we've gone from two to one and a half, and we've stayed at one and a half. There's a T here, and there's another T out here in the high tunnel, and that's also a one and a half inch pipe. What so, about, um, don't you want to also uh, kind of keep, keep uh, the bends in the pipe to a minimum, yeah, right? Yeah. The, the fewer bends and the more gradual they are, the better. I, I, the amount of elbows and bends we have here really is not going to have much impact, but if you're doing a larger system, the more, the more twists and turns you have, the more pressure losses you have. Um, the reason for this large size pipe is friction on the walls of the pipe. The smaller you get, the more friction losses there are. But for this pressure, in this size plot, that size pipe, the friction losses are pretty much minuscule. Okay. Yeah. So what are what do we have here as far as these? Um... I just brought these. Uh, these you can get from tank supply places. These are called uh, bulkhead fittings. And if you have a large agricultural tank or some other thing, you want to make your own system, and their outlet's too small. You can uh, use a hole saw and cut out this diameter in the tank and then use this as your outlet tank so that outlet. back end would be on the inside of the tank? Yeah, the back end is a little tricky because if you've got a big tank that you can't crawl into, you have to have a hard piece of rod or wire and go from the tank opening to the top down of the tank inside. down to the outlet and let that let this fitting just ride on that wire and you can fish it out from your opening and tighten it up with I think there are probably YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> so okay, so this in for this example, this PVC pipe is buried, but yeah. it doesn't have to be. No. Right? Um what's the benefit or, or drawback? Uh, burying we, the we we buried it here because of their mowing. We don't want things to get broken up in the mower, and uh, you can see it's only about five or six inches down. And then it it it's an elbow here to a T here, and we're joined with another tank here. And then it goes out, slopes up gradually to that uh, T fitting there. So, and the other thing. You can see here the other bits of plumbing. This is just a a wash to empty the tank or to wash your hands or whatever. This is the main valve here. And here's the that's a, you can use that for whatever you want to use it for. And this one thing we found out the hard way, if you bury these pipes and water stays in there and we have a hard winter and very extreme low temperatures like we had last winter, pipes will freeze and break, and that's what happened. So after that, we buried a five-gallon bucket here with gravel in the bottom, and there's a T-fitting, which comes from both tanks and then goes out to the, to the uh, tunnel, and then we put in a drain valve there. You see there's gravel underneath there, so it'll drain right out. And that just winterizes, drains the pipe so it won't freeze. Mm -hmm. So, okay, so we're talking about rainwater catchment, right? So you've got to have some way to get the water from the tunnel roof mm -hmm. to the tank. 
Um, let's talk about options. Okay. Uh, people can install their own gutters. Yep. Right. We've, we've people, you that. learned that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they can also hire someone to do it relatively quickly. Yeah. Right. Um, so what are some options that people should consider? What are some things to keep in mind? The nice thing about these gutters, which they were installed by a professional, is that they're one piece. So really easy. They did this really fast and one extruded piece of aluminum. Um, if you do it yourself with the, I think they're six foot long pieces, they work okay. It just uh, takes a lot of time. And if you do it yourself, don't use the cheap fasteners for the, the gutters. That the things that hold the gutter that up, usually, right? Yeah, that usually right come with use the professional grade stuff, which are these gutter hangers here. Uh, you can see there's a slope. See from this angle. Yeah, you want the gutter to kind of gradually yep. lean towards. I think it's six eight tank. inches per hundred feet. Okay. And you can eyeball that. I saw the professionals do it. They didn't measure anything. They took a jug of water and that in, and they poured it in, and and just watched it flow. So pretty easy. On this end. Your tank has to be in position so that it can go under the gutter. The other thing you want to do, if your gutters aren't screened, um, here's a real high quality uh, gutter guard screen that I've used on my house. But a short piece of this screen should be cut to go inside. Put inside there where the uh, downspout goes into the tank. Just to keep, keep all debris, that debris out of the out tank. Of it. Uh, the, you say the sectional gutters you buy at the big box stores, they work fine. Just more trouble to install. The other thing is that if you look in the tunnel, the board on top is the hip board that's part of the tunnel construction but we put in the board below that just for the gutter so we added a, another board to hold the gutter and that could be retrofitted so if somebody oh, yeah. had a high tunnel all this they, was retro and then they added this all later mm -hmm. right so it's not the end of the world if you didn't necessarily plan from the beginning to have yeah. bring that account yeah. right so Okay, so we've got the tank, we've got the gutters, we talked about the opening, right? Um, let's, can we see this uh, catchment, this irrigation in action? Let's, let's see what that looks like for people. That sounds exciting, Rachel. <laughs> let's open the valve, and we've got about two feet four inches, about one PSI pressure here. So we'll open the main valve here. Water will flow through this T out to the T in the high tunnel and then we've only got a couple drip lines hooked up to show. So you can see the, the lay flat um, that's connected to this PVC um, T here, right? You saw that inflate with water. And then here, the drip tape, you can see it is fully functional, right? There's water coming out of these emitters, right? And so we've only got about one PSI of pressure, right? So this is not going to be a quick irrigation, but imagine that your tank is completely filled with water, right? Our tank is currently only half filled with water. So you get a little bit more pressure and, um, you'd be good to go. And certainly, you know, you'd be able to leave it on for quite some time and irrigate your crops with rainwater. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is that with this very low pressure, we call it ultra low pressure, the flow rate of the drip tape is probably about half of what it would normally be with, with eight or 10 PSI. So if it's half gallon per 100 feet of row, it's going to be more like a quarter gallon.
So very slow. Yep. <laughs> so you have to let it run longer. And for anyone who's wondering if the pressure is, you know, the same throughout, it is. So there is, you know, water dripping along this whole line. This, this whole drip line is filled with water, right? It's not, it's not as uh, tense as it could be, but it is there. It's not as pressurized as it could be, but there is water um, dripping throughout the length of this tunnel. So we did show you that you can drip irrigate just with the tank alone as long as you, your water height is at least, let's say, 2.3 feet um, from the spot that you want to irrigate, right? 2.3 feet in height. Um, but let's say you want to irrigate a little faster. Um, there is an option. Um, we have a solar panel here that you can um, actually drive a pump and the pump will pump the water through the line and at a higher pressure. So Brent, let's, let's kind of go through the different components and maybe some cost approximations for people of, of what they could expect. So we have the, the pump here, right? Um, this is about a 30 watt panel and now these are from a solar supply place. They're thirty dollars or less, so it's a pretty cheap panel. And we just mount it on a post. Uh, you can go online and find the correct angle of the sun for the, the latitude where you're working. That's all easy. And uh, you power this small submersible pump made by the Rule Company. I think it's one of the smallest they have. There's, these are bilge pumps. They're used in boats. So they're 12 volt pumps. That's a 12 volt panel. Uh, the company advised us not to run the pump directly off the solar panel because the voltage of the panel fluctuates can go from 12 volts up to almost 20 volts and that's not good on the pump. So instead of running it directly, we use a charge of a little 12 volt battery that runs the pump. That way, you can also run the pump on a rainy day or when you have a cloudy day. And the battery is just enclosed in a cheap little uh, plastic box. And inside the box, we have this is an inexpensive voltage controller that keeps the panel from overcharging the battery. And then the battery is just, uh, uh, this one's a Duracell uh, 9 amp hour battery, a gel, I think it's a gel battery. But those are all, all this pretty inexpensive. And inside we just have the connections, we have a fuse and an on and off switch, which turns the pump on and off. Um, the pump itself is wired up with some uh, waterproof connections here and you cut a piece of hardy board so regular wood would rot away but this stuff doesn't and the pump is bolted on there onto a strip of aluminum rod from the home improvement store and then the pump is just submerged in the You can also put a, put a screw through the aluminum and through the lip of the tank if you want to hold it in place. Uh, and when it's turned on, that pumps through the small PVC pipe directly into our main line that comes from the tank. You close off the tank valve on both sides, pumps directly into the drip system. So that, we, we did this initially because this tank was on the lower side of the slope. We thought maybe the pressure wasn't enough, so we put this in to supplement it. But in fact, as long as we 
keep the water height up a couple feet, you usually don't have a problem and don't need to use the solar pump. On another place where we install one of these, the tank was even lower on the slope. So we used the same pump to pump water from the low tank to the high tank and then irrigate it from the high tank. And what's about the pressure that um, would be in the in the line once you turn the pump on? I can't remember the specs of this pump, but I think it's like the flow rate is pretty low, so you know you can do a tunnel this size, no problem with a pump like that. But anything bigger, is probably too much. Mm -hmm. it's just not enough. There's enough pressure, but not enough flow. And where do you get uh, that kind of pump? Uh, this one came from a boat supply place just out of town here, but get them online. That particular brand, brand is Rule, R-U-L-E, they put a lot of money, and they make them in all different sizes. Okay. Um, so yeah, that small PVC pipe, he is connected to the main pipe. Yeah, that goes right into the tunnel. Okay, so... As you can see, this um, tank is actually pretty clean, but that's only because someone has cleaned it recently. Um, they use this pretty handy long-handled brush. It's actually a ceiling fan brush. You can buy it at a you know home improvement store. Um, but yeah, you've got to get in there and scrub the inside of this tank occasionally because if you don't, you can see this tank needs to be cleaned. Um, there will be a lot of like algae growth um, because, right, it's a clear tank with sunlight passing through it. Um, so what are some, what's kind of the, the cost, benefit, advantage, disadvantage between a clear tank and uh, like a black tank? We'd be better off with black if, if we could get them cheaply, but mm -hmm. they're not usually available in cheap tanks like these. Okay. And like you said, with, with clear, you're going to get algae growth inside. The one thing to keep in mind, if you keep water flowing, you're using it all the time, and water is flowing all the time, you won't have as much You won't have as much issue. It's when it's laid, uh, left sitting for Extended weeks and months, it really gets nasty. Well, in you know, a black tank, obviously the water is going to be pretty hot coming out of it. Yeah. Um, it shouldn't be too much of an issue, I wouldn't expect. Um, but yes, so a lot of the tanks you'll find are actually dark in color and op um, opaque um, because they're trying to avoid this kind of um, algae growth. Yeah. Okay, so for those of you um, who may have missed a detail or you want to know more or you video is just not the way that you like to learn. Um, everything we have talked about today is in Off the Grid by Brent Rowell and Krista Jacobson. It is a UK publication. You can find it online. Um, it's free and you can download it. Another really helpful um, publication to keep in mind is these simple calculations for small drip irrigation systems. Also a publication by Brent Rowell and um, this will help you figure out um, how much and, and, ha and how to set up a drip irrigation system and, and for what size of plot, right? Whether it be high tunnel or something, something slightly bigger.